part three of our prophecy update series. And last time, we closed with something Jesus said on Tuesday of Passion Week, three days before he died. He was in the temple, and as they were leaving the temple, and some of his disciples were saying, Lord, look at how beautiful this temple is. He made this shocking statement. He said, as for these things which you behold, the days will come in which not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And the disciples shot at what he was telling them, that this amazing temple, which had taken 47 years to rebuild, that it was going to be torn down. It seemed impossible. It was so huge, so ornate, so glorious. They asked him four questions. They said, what, when will this happen? What will be the sign that it's going to happen? And what will be the sign of your return and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered all four of those questions in what is known as the Olivet Discourse, Luke 21, Matthew 24, but put up verse 20 here, Luke 21, 20. And Jesus at the end of his discourse said, the sign that the destruction of the temple is about to happen is when you will see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. And then go to verse 24. And he said, and he said, what will happen is Jerusalem will be destroyed, and the Jewish people shall fall by the edge of the sword, and thou sh they shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down or dominated, be under the forceful control of the Gentiles, the non-Jewish nations. But then he said this amazing word, until that those times of Gentile domination over Jerusalem are fulfilled. So with the word until, Jesus was saying, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed and the Jewish people are going to be dispersed, which they were as slaves. And Jerusalem will be out of the hands of the Jewish people until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So he was saying until means that there will be a day in, in the future when Jerusalem will return to the hands of the Jewish people, and that will be when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And this event that Jesus was talking about had also been prophesied by Daniel 550 years before Christ. Put up Daniel 9, verse 25, Seth. And this is when Daniel was praying about when the uh, Jews would be allowed to return from Babylon after the 70 year captivity. And in Daniel 9, 25, Daniel prayed and Gabriel came and gave him an answer right from the throne. And Daniel was given a prophecy that told precisely when Messiah the Prince would arrive that the city and the temple, Jerusalem, would be rebuilt. Then Messiah the Prince would come. Then the next verse. Then the Messiah, when he came, would be cut off. And the Hebrew means he would die a criminal execution. And after the Messiah's death, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy Jerusalem, the city, and the sanctuary. So it was right in God's prophetic plan that when the Messiah comes, when the king prophesied to set up God's kingdom in Jerusalem over all the earth, when he comes, he won't set up his kingdom right away on his first. He won't set up the visible kingdom anyway, but he will actually die. And after he dies, Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed by the people of the prince that shall come. So Luke 21, 24, I said. And so this is what Jesus is affirming 550 years later, three days before his death, he's saying that 
Jerusalem will be destroyed and the Jewish people will disperse. So that just brings a question, okay, and that happened in 70 AD, in 66 AD, the Jewish people revolted against Roman rule. They wanted to be self-governing. And what eventually happened was the Romans eventually got into Jerusalem, destroyed the city totally, and sent tens of thousands of Jews in slavery, dispersing them throughout the Roman Empire. And that began a period of wandering. For the Jewish people. From 70, 70 AD onward, they really did not have what we would call an influential presence in the land that they had been given through Abraham. And this leads us into some amazing questions and thoughts regarding the, the nature of God's prophetic plan. Because I'm going to give us some dates here because, of course, Jesus Christ rose from the dead just a few days after he made those predictions and the Christian church began on the day of Pentecost. So we have, and we'll just kind of use these dates as round numbers from 30 to 330 AD, we have what we would call the Apostolic Church or the New Testament Church, a church like the one we're in today where the message is, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He rose from the dead. He has conquered sin, death, and judgment. If you open your heart to him and receive him, you'll be born again and saved forever. That was the apostolic New Testament church. But then in the year 326, the emperor Constantine, uh, he made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And that brought changes in the Christian church and it eventually evolved into what we would call the Catholic Church. And we'll just mention here, we're not going to go into it, but I was, well I shouldn't have said that maybe, but I was raised Catholic and many of us maybe were, maybe some of us that are watching this video perhaps were raised Catholic or you are Catholic. And the creed that many people say every Mass is we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And the claim that the Catholic Church makes is that it is the original church of the apostles started by Peter and the apostles. And we will just say very kindly and lovingly that's not true. That's just a total out and out untruth. The Catholic Church had its beginning in 326 AD when it became the official religion of the Roman Empire and it went through changes where eventually it could even be recognizable with what's in the Bible, but that's another message. But it's important for us to know that. Why? Because for 1,500 years, more or less, there was really no study of the prophetic plan. And why is that? Because as the Catholic Church, as the state church became very powerful and Europe became came under the dominion more and more of the Pope and kings and queens of Europe submitted themselves to the Pope because through the events that happened over hundreds of years, the Pope and the Catholic Church took on the, this role of authority that said, we are the kingdom of God that has come. And something came along in the midst of all this, and it's called replacement theology. And I'll just write that out since it's kind of a fancy term. Replacement Theology. And this was the belief, this was the claim, this was the assertion from the Catholic Church and then after that Israel, because they rejected Christ, the Messiah, when he came, because they did that, they forfeited 
their place as God's chosen people in his plan. And because they did that, even all those glorious prophecies in the Old Testament about the kingdom of God on earth from Jerusalem and God's king, the son of Abraham, the son of Israel from the house of Judah through the line of King David, all those prophecies, and some of them we read from Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Israel, those don't apply to Israel anymore because they forfeited their privilege by rejecting Christ. The church, the Christian church, has taken the place of Israel and all the promises of God. Now the kingdom of God is the church. And look at how glorious and powerful we are. Look at the reign we have over Europe, the basis of Western civilization. Look at these powerful cathedrals that we build that testify to the majesty and the authority of the Holy Roman Church. That was the thinking, folks. So the idea of the original prophetic plan of the King of Israel, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, reigning from his throne in Jerusalem over all the earth, that was pretty much out of the picture. Now, in the 1500s, something took place, and we're all here, and maybe many of our watchers are also because of it, something called the Protestant Reformation. And that's a whole other message. We're kind of covering a lot of history, but we want to stay focused on the theme of prophecy. But the Protestant Reformation happened officially in 1517. It started in Germany with Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest who basically knew that he was not good, that he was an evil, wicked sinner, and he was looking for God truly, and God showed him the truth that it is through faith personal faith in Christ, a personal encounter with him, that we are made righteous and saved. And he, God revealed that to him, and that began a move, a new, we can even call it a rebirth of the apostolic message of salvation by grace through faith. And that began in 1517, and that basically brought the Bible back into the hands of the common man for hundreds of years Prior to this, with the advent of the Catholic Church and the control of the, of the Catholic Church over so many aspects of life, there was the person, the average Joe wasn't studying the Bible. But all of a sudden, the Protestant Reformation happens, and people are getting born again, and they're going to the Word of God, and the Bible's being translated and printed in all kinds of languages. And as a result of that, people began questioning this idea of replacement theology and that Israel, in turn, as far as God's plan went, that they were out. Some were saying, you know, I don't really know if that's true. And let's look at these verses, Romans 11, verse 1. And here's what's amazing. The Apostle Paul is actually making it very clear to us in the Word what God's plan is was, because the Apostle Paul says, I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. So the Apostle Paul's asking when people say, hey, has God forgotten Israel? The Apostle Paul's saying, God forbid, of course he hasn't. But he's explaining the plan of God. So now look at verse 25. Romans 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. Blindness to Jesus Christ, being their promised Messiah. That has happened in part to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles is coming. Meaning until the glorious vast numbers of non-Jewish people all over the world come to faith in the Messiah that Israel did not recognize.
times. And then put up verse, uh, next verse. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. That's God speaking. And then put up verse 29. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And this is a great verse, folks, Romans 11 29, because a lot of times Christians quote this verse and say, oh, you know, if God's called you to do that, you know, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. But in the context, the Apostle Paul, he's speaking of God's call upon Israel as a chosen nation, as a chosen people. And he's saying, you know what? If God called Israel to be his chosen people, then, and he has called them to be a nation of kings and priests who will cover the whole earth when God's kingdom is established in Jerusalem, then you know what? God's not going to revoke that. So he's making that very clear. So now, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 37. And here's an amazing passage of Scripture that once again, God, knowing that people would, wouldn't get it right, that they would misunderstand his word, his plan, Ezekiel 37, verse 1. And this is written by the prophet Ezekiel about 600 years before Christ. And here it is. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many bones in the open valley, and they were very dry. And he, God, said to me, Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said to me, prophesy upon these bones and say to them, O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Go to verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived up, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. So before we go any further, here's a, here's a prophetic vision that God is giving Ezekiel 600 years before the birth of Christ. And it's a vision of a valley of dry bones and God is saying, Ezekiel, these bones speak of the, of the spiritual grave of my people Israel, that in their time of wandering, in their time when they feel that they have been cut off from the plan of God, and they are saying, our hope is lost. Our heritage with God has been removed. God is saying to Ezekiel through a vision, watch what's going to happen to my people when they and others say the hope of Israel has been cut off. Next verse. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. So here's an amazing prophetic vision that was dealing with the very fact that after a long time, when 
a lot of people and a lot of theologians would be saying, Israel is no longer in the spiritually prophetic picture. God is saying, I'm going to raise you up, Israel, and I'm going to bring you back into this land. But now, let's put up Hosea chapter 3, verse 4. Because here's another great passage, because there are various, there have been various voices through the generations that have said of Ezekiel 37 and other passages that those passages, they're not talking about a return of the Jews to the land in the latter days, but that's talking about when they came back from Babylon after 70 years or other times when they were out of the land and they came back. And we're going to show through this passage, folks, that that's not true. Because there's an amazing passage written by the prophet Hosea about 750 to 800 years before the birth of Christ. And here's what he said. He said, the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king or a prince and without a sacrifice and an ephod and without an image and teraphim. So the, so the children of Israel are going to abide many days without one, a king or prince, two, a sacrifice or a priest's robe, that's what an ephod is, or three, images and teraphim, which speaks of idolatry. Next verse. But afterward, shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord in his goodness in the latter days. Now here's what's amazing about this passage, folks. The only time that the Jewish people went many days, many generations, many centuries, hundreds of years, without a king or prince, referring to self-rulership, without a sacrifice or a priest, meaning they had it, because they usually had a temple or a place to offer sacrifices during much of their earlier existence in the ancient world, but that, this, those verses saying there will come a time, a long time, when they will have no place to sacrifice. And they will have no priesthood to help administrate for them. And there will also be a long period of time when they will not be in idolatry. And that's very important because throughout their history in the ancient world, many times as a nation, they were given over to idolatry. But this passage is saying a time will come in the history of the Jewish people when they will not have self-rule. They will have no way to carry out the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, but they will not be idolaters. And folks, that period of time is from the year 70 to the 1900s, specifically after the destruction of 70 AD that Jesus talked about. That is telling us that Israel, despite them wandering hundreds of years without a homeland, without a temple, without any national entity to speak of, that they were not forsaken in the prophetic plan of God, and that God still had a plan for them, and it was going to be fulfilled even after that long period of wandering, so what happens, folks, is just as God always does, we have something amazing happen. We have the beginnings of what is known as dispensationalism. I'll write this term out here. And all of a sudden, we have the 1800s. And we have born-again men of God, and they're studying the Bible, and they're studying the prophecies. And they're saying, hey, you know what? This replacement theology stuff that says the church has replaced Israel in Bible prophecy, we don't agree. We're studying the Word. And we see very clearly that God still has a plan for Israel. And in fact, we believe 
And they were saying this in the 1800s. Uh, they, we were, they were saying, you know what? We believe that one of the next great prophetic events in God's plan that will signal the return of Jesus Christ is that Israel is going to return to her land. That the Jews will return to Palestine and they will be a people and a nation again with a temple worshiping God. We believe that's what Bible prophecy is telling us. And what's amazing, folks, is dispensationalism and this new birth in Bible prophecy started happening in the 1800s and the 1900s. And names like John Darby and William Blackstone. And C.I. Schofield, some folks still have his study Bible, and Clarence Larkin. These were pastors in the United States, in England, in Ireland, and they began propagating this truth. And all of a sudden, they're saying Israel is going to return to her land someday. And with that, we have what was called the birth. How much time do we have left, Jared? Three minutes? Four. Four minutes. That's an eternity. We still have four minutes. All right. <laughs> we have what is called the birth of Zionism in the late 1800s. And I'm going to write two names. Herzl. Theodore Herzl. He was an Austrian Jew, a Jew, Austrian Jew. And William Blackstone, he was an American evangelical evangelist. And Zionism, folks, Zionism kind of has a bad label in today's terms, but you are a Zionist if you believe that Israel has ancestral rights to the land that they lived in. And we would say, yes, of course, because God promised them that land through Abraham and so forth and so on. So to be a Zionist means you believe that Israel has a national ancestral right to possess and live in the land that they had originally. That's what a Zionist is. And the Zionism movement began in the late 1800s. And it began primarily through the efforts of two people. Theodore Herzl, he was an Austrian Jew. And what's amazing is that the best information we have about his life is that he was an atheist. But because of the rampant anti-Semitism that he witnessed as a journalist in Europe and in Russia where Jews were attacked, Jews were hated, Jews were killed and, and beaten terribly for no reason that they were just Jewish because of anti-Semitism. He, he began to propagate the idea, you know what, the only way the Jewish people are going to be safe is if we have our own land and country to dwell in. And then the other great father of Zionism, William E. Blackstone. He was an American evangelist, and he was so fervent and so passionate about what he saw in God's prophetic plan that God has a plan for Israel to return them to the land he gave them in the last days, and that is one of the principal signs that the return of Jesus Christ is near and he actually ended up getting his cause to President Harris in 19, 1891 and President Woodrow Wilson in 1914 and he was so influential along with Theodore Herzl in bringing a international sympathy to the cause of Israel and their land. So that's the end of part three, and we'll pick up next time. Thank you.